Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I've got an announcement, first of all, that uh, CSIS wants to put out. I think you've probably seen a video uh, streaming. Uh, in addition to welcoming you to the rollout of this report, before we get started, I want to let you know that Mike Green and I are your, quote, responsible officers noted in the safety video that played before we walked in. So please look to us for direction in case of an emergency. And I'll be the guy running out back. When, <laughs> but look, um, thanks, of course, to CSIS for being our landlords here and giving us this, this great time. Um, and I must say, I'm delighted to be in the presence of uh, my colleagues here and what's turned out to be our fourth Armitage Nye report. Never did Joe Nye and I think we were going to be seated here again doing yet another report. We were finished with that. Uh, we were going out the back door uh, of our report writing days. But I think it's fair to say that as we started to think about the future, Joe and I, we had a conversation. We decided our future was a little unclear. It was unclear for several reasons. One is the, the transactional America first uh, attitude uh, and orientation of this administration. It's the protectionist policies uh, combined with a questioning about the value of forward basing and alliances. So it, that began to unsettle Joe and I. Uh, and this is all happening at the same time that there seems to be a spreading of what we call authoritarian capitalism. And the fact that there are only two Asia experts, Randy Shriver and Matt Pottinger, who, at, who are at high levels in this administration. So there are plenty of reasons for us to have that unsettled feeling. So we thought it appropriate to indicate that there is a future for our alliance. We do want to demonstrate to the world and to the region that Japan and the United States share values, we share responsibilities, we share interests. We do not, we look at trade and defense alliances as things that add to us, that bring value to us. They're not something that makes us seem like chumps on the world stage. So we've developed 10 specific recommendations and they're in four different baskets, economic, military, technology, cooperation, and regional issues. Now we do this not because the eight of us love Japan. I think we all have a great affection for Japan, for the people, and for the nation. But we do it because we love our country. And we feel this is so much in our interest. Japan is the most capable U.S. ally in the world. And Japan is in the most important area of the world, in the most important region. And we make the point that unless we're moving forward, we're falling behind, because standing still is falling behind. So with that, I'll ask my good friend, distinguished co-chair, uh, Dr. Joseph Nye, if he'd like to make a few remarks. And then we're going to work our way down the panel, five minutes max for each of us, and then we'll throw it open to you uh, for Q&A. So, Dr. Knight. Uh, thank you very much, Rich. It's interesting if, if, to start with the title of our report, more important than ever. And the reason that's interesting is that when Rich and I first started cooperating on this issue way back in the 90s, a uh, quarter of a century ago, uh, you could see the beginning of uh, the rise of Chinese power. But in terms of the global balance of power and America's position in the world and in East Asia, uh, this has continued and it's probably as important a strategic change as you can see. When we designed policy uh, at that time, we decided we would try to engage China, but the critical point was to reaffirm the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And Mike Green and others helped as we worked on that. Uh, and I think that meant that we could shape the environment in which Chinese power grew. And that's more important than ever. In other words, in that sense, the title of this is as relevant as ever. Rich and I did our uh, other three reports 
basically to show that there was a bipartisan American support for this, that this was a very broad and deep-based national interest. And I think that was, uh, uh, has been borne out over time through many administrations, but there has been concern in the, in the last uh, year or two about whether uh, we're seeing a situation where the alliance is called into question. Uh, there's particular, President Trump is particularly uh, focused on this issue of burden sharing and allies doing their bit and even during the campaign of 2016 raised the question of whether we should be involved in this. I think what's intriguing here is that despite all that, this alliance is rem in remarkably good shape. But it could be endangered both by economic friction that we're seeing growing out of trade wars and also by a failure to realize that in terms of burden sharing, Japan does an extraordinary amount. We have a phrase in the report pointing out that uh, Japan uh, provides about three quarters of the costs of American troops in Japan through host nation support. Uh, that is very impressive. If it's in our interest to be uh, present in East Asia to manage the rise of Chinese power, having a significant ally like Japan that is willing to pay three quarters of the costs of our forward presence is more important than ever. So I would argue before we get into the detailed recommendations in the report, which we'll now hear, about the things we can do to strengthen the report, some of the problems we face, some of the things we can do to strengthen it. It's worth remembering the truth that is embodied in the title of the report, more important than ever. Give us a, an exposition of uh, regional uh, issues. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, a number of us who uh, worked on the report with Rich and Joe are going to provide some uh, strategic context, and Zach Cooper will give some of the specific recommendations. <clears throat> and I'm going to say something about um, uh, the broader balance of power uh, strategic setting uh, in Asia uh, before turning to Victor to talk about the Korean Peninsula specifically. Um, I, I've been on the Nye Armitage report since the first one in 2000, <clears throat> and looking at the strategic environment, um, it's it's interesting to look back at how things have evolved. In 2000, uh, when we issued the first report, um, the U.S. was able to operate in the South China Sea with impunity. Um, the East China Sea saw virtually no Chinese um, Coast Guard or PLA Navy activity. Um, North Korea had launched a Tepo Dong, but the debate about the North Korean threat was more about American commitment and intentions. <clears throat> there was not a um, substantial uh, missile threat to Japan like we see today with hundreds of missiles and nuclear weapons. Uh, Japan was the second largest economy in the world. <clears throat> um, the U.S. Air Force, the Japan Air Self-Defense Forces enjoyed um, uh, dominance uh, in the tactical air <clears throat> over the um, region around Japan. Um, all of those have changed. Um, the South China Sea is contested. Uh, there are regular, um, almost daily, if not weekly, Chinese Coast Guard and uh, increasingly PLA Navy activities around the East China Sea. <clears throat> North Korea threatens, as I said, Japan's the number three economy, and uh, the PLA Air Force is positioned to possibly have more fifth generation stealth aircraft operating <clears throat> in the East China Sea than the US and Japan have combined over the next uh, 10 years. Um, there are some good developments, though. Uh, in 2000, when we wrote the report, it was very much a bilateral report. Um, Japan's relationship with Australia was 99% a trading relationship. Uh, since then, we've had um, a, a trilateral and bilateral security relationship between Japan and Australia that's quite uh, advanced, with more to come, but quite advanced. Uh, Japan's relationship with India and the U.S. relationship with India was stuck on the nuclear test uh, India had, test had conducted in 1998. Today. Uh, Japan India relations are on a steady upward trajectory. The Quad has been uh, mobilized, content to be defined. Um, but on a trilateral basis, the US, Japan, and India now do more, far more than before. Uh, and maybe most importantly, in 2000, the Armitage Nye report was uh, in some ways a plea or really a pledge to bipartisan support for the alliance before a major election um, at a time when uh, there was debate 
um, within both parties, not between the parties. <clears throat> and um, uh, there, I think, is very robust consensus in public opinion polls in the Congress and among policy experts about the alliance. The balance of power challenges we face have also uh, shifted in some important ways. As Joe said, <clears throat> the original impulse of the Nye Initiative in the Pentagon and the Armitage Nye Report was positioning the U.S. and Japan better to shape, to shape China's choices, China's role in Asia. <clears throat> um, in some ways, we're well positioned to do that today because of the relationships we have with Australia and India and all the major powers in the region. Um, in some ways, we're worse off because the smaller powers in Southeast Asia um, are uh, not as resilient um, and need, uh, as Matt will discuss, Chinese infrastructure help. We're in a much more challenging environment um, in a second area I would briefly mention. You know, we were focused in the early reports on shaping Chinese choices, which is in the military parlance phase zero, peacetime. Uh, we increasingly have to worry about contingencies um, and, and China's ability to um, pull off uh, success in military contingencies because of the trends I described in PLA military capabilities. So you'll find in our report we emphasize um, uh, the strength of the alliance but also the need to move faster in terms of jointness, efficiency, uh, getting more efficiencies from jointness, uh, shared intelligence, shared capabilities. Um, uh, in part to shore up our ability to shape Chinese choices in phase zero in peacetime by working with other major powers, but also because we won't be able to um, encourage China to move in a positive direction if the PLA can go into Jiananghai and say, we can win in a fight. And so the military dimension is important, not just for contingencies, but because that's what backstops the peaceful uh, intentions of the alliance that Joe and I articulated and Rich articulated almost 20 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Green. I'd like to ask Dr. Victor Cha to give us some context of the, on the peninsula, if you would. Sure. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> um, so again, it was a pleasure to be part of this report the second time I've had a, the privilege to work on, on this report. Um, with regard to Korea, as you all know, um, since 1969, but even before 1969, when Nixon and Sato signed a joint communique that has something called the Korea Clause in it. Korea has always been connected to Japan's security and the security of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, today, I think the United States, Japan, and South Korea share the goals of a diplomatic resolution of the North Korea issue as well as the complete verifiable, or whatever we call it now, complete verifiable, permanent, irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, but we are clearly in diplomatically moving into uncharted territory. Um, um, nuclear threats, but also love letters that are being sent back and forth. Um, but the threats are very real. And as Mike said, the, these threats are very real to um, not just South Korea, but to the second and third largest economies in the world, the United States and Japan. So it's important as we move forward uh, in terms of this uncharted diplomacy that trilateral cooperation and coordination among the U.S., Japan, and South Korea increase, not decrease. It has kind of dropped off, frankly, quite a bit um, <clears throat> in over the past couple of years. Um, and this is not just trilateral coordination for the sake of trilateral coordination, but really trying to align expectations and views on things like verification and what we seek um, as the United States and South Korea uh, enter these negotiations with North Korea. It's also important that not, not only that there be coordination among Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo, but that there be better coordination between Seoul and Tokyo, the Japan-Korea leg of, the, of this uh, triangular relationship. Um, if the other two lines are solid lines, this has always been the dotted line. And the more that we can do to fill in that dotted line with better information sharing, um, uh, better coordination in terms of our militaries, would be something that would not just be good for Japan and Korea, but would be good for the overall state of both U.S.-Japan and U.S.-South Korea bilateral um, alliance relationships. Um, again, even as the diplomacy moves forward, the threats are still very real uh, from the North in terms of the ballistic missile, nuclear artillery threats. And for this reason, trilateral coordination should not just be on diplomacy about what should be the line um, going into the next set of negotiations um, uh, that are to take place, but it should also be about um, 
better trilateral exercising in terms of enhancing nuclear deterrence, extended deterrence, um, uh, better trilateral coordination on missile defense, um, as well as better coordination on uh, counterproliferation of uh, North Korean capabilities. Um, <clears throat> but I think probably the most important um, uh, recommendation going forward, because we don't know where all this is going to go, um, but based on what we've seen thus far, is that it is incumbent, indeed, um, imperative that the Allies agree that as we move forward with negotiations with North Korea, that we do not prematurely sacrifice any core alliance equities, um, uh, which, you know, I think some would argue was one of the things that happened in the last meeting, the Singapore summit, uh, with this decision to suspend exercises. So going forward, there are, of course, things that we can look for in terms of verification of, of uh, any denuclearization that takes place, but there should be really no premature um, surrendering of core alliance capabilities either between the U.S. and Japan, or the U.S. ROC, or, or trilaterally. Thank you, Dr. Cha. I've asked Dr. Sheila Smith uh, to make some co uh, comments uh, about the politics in, in both Japan uh, and uh, here. So, Sheila. Kevin's helping me with my microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is my first time to participate, and in five minutes, I'll tell you all about the politics <laughs> that surround this relationship. Now, to be serious here, obviously, how our citizens view uh, the value of this alliance is the foundational uh, piece of the puzzle. And we have had some unsettling politics in Japan over the last decade, as well as here in the United States. And we, I would say, um, both of our democracies um, have questioned some of the principles of our alliance. They have questioned the way we implement alliance cooperation. But I have um, pretty strong faith that we have the ability to, uh, to speak to new leaders, to speak to those who don't have expertise in the region, to advocate on behalf of this partnership, which I think we all here believe in strongly. Um, the DPJ came into power in 2009, and, and many of you were here and know it rattled Washington pretty significantly. Um, now we are seeing the same kind of reaction in Tokyo to our presidential election. Some of my friends said to me, Japan is never in American politics. Japan is never discussed anymore. Does this mean America, Japan is not important to the United States? Well, in 2016, our alliance with Japan was back in the spotlight in a rather uncomfortable way. But I think since we have the new administration, events have largely shaped public perceptions of the value of this partnership. Again, North Korea. Uh, the behavior also of China, both in the economic and strategic realm, have shaped American perceptions of how important these alliances are to our security and our well-being. The Chicago Council just put out a poll, just this week in fact, and it is the highest number of Americans who have responded that the United States should be engaged in world affairs since they began polling in the mid-1970s. So I think, just to, just to reassure you here, I think our public has a very high regard both for Japan, but also for our alliance with Japan and our alliances more broadly. Um, I think when we were having this discussion that led to the report, which I hope you will read um, more carefully, um, we all understood that one of the pieces of the puzzle that has bothered us is the lack of the emphasis of our shared values, the lack of the emphasis of the foundational aspects of our democracy, rule of law, our commitment to the global institutions that have we have led Japan and the United States uh, over the last half century or more, but also the, that basically inform our collaboration across the Asia Pacific and indeed across the globe. And I think that's one of the pieces of the puzzle that um, we want to emphasize in this report, that regardless of how our elections may go one year or the next, that this partnership is based on profound belief in some of the, the underpinnings of democracy and the rule of law. I think. The regard that many of us around the region and around the globe have for Prime Minister Abe, in fact, uh, has been based on his continued uh, behavior on the global stage as well as in the Asia Pacific to make sure that these shared values continue to be at the forefront of, of the way we would look at the world, but also the way we define our partnership. Let me just say a couple uh, comments about elections. We have had a couple in Japan. Uh, we are about to have a big one here in the United States. Um, in Japan, the, 
LDP leadership election, the LDP voted for continuity and stability. Uh, prime Minister Abe now is in, uh, it will be probably the longest serving Japanese Prime Minister uh, in post-war history. Um, he uh, obviously uh, continues to make the Japanese people feel that the Japanese foreign policy is one of the primary uh, movers of their uh, future security and stability. In Okinawa too, however, voters also opted for continuity. Uh, the, the death of the governor in Okinawa, Mr. Onaga, uh, created a special election. Uh, the all Okinawa social movement uh, candidate, uh, his successor in some ways, uh, was voted into office overwhelmingly on September 30th. So again, I think our alliance has to take care that we understand the sentiments in Okinawa and that we continue to work on this particular um, focal point for our relationship. We are going to have a midterm election uh, in November. I don't think anybody in the audience doesn't know that fact. Uh, it is not necessarily a referendum on our foreign policy, le least of all our relationship with Japan. But I do think it will be a referendum by the American people on the ideas mm -hmm. Uh, and the decisions that have been made by President Trump. I think it's a complex time in our politics. I, I wouldn't want to try to predict the outcome here or even to tell you how the outcome might shape the alliance. But I think it's important, and in efforts like this, that we continue to make sure that this conversation about the value of our partnership with Japan continues to be part of the way that the American people understand the decision making here in Washington. Um, we have in the polling I m noted earlier, I think a pretty broad consensus in this country that we must remain engaged in the world. We have in the Pew poll that was released and discussed here yesterday, I believe, also a suggestion that the Japanese people are increasingly worried about our long-term commitment and our long-term influence in the region, although they overwhelmingly support the Japanese partnership with the United States. So these elections matter. These efforts to speak more broadly to the American people and to the Japanese people about the value of our partnership also matter. Uh, and so I'm delighted to be part of this effort. Thank you, Rich. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Uh, with the first and third largest economies uh, in the world, it's uh, clear that economics and finance have to take a, a big spot in our report, so we've decided to have two experts uh, do the heavy lifting. So I'll ask uh, Kevin Neeler, first of all, to start, and then we'll uh, go on to uh, Matt Goodman. Kevin? Pastor Armitage, thanks so much, uh, and, and thank you and, and Dr. Nye for your leadership once again, and, for, uh, and to Dr. Cooper for uh, the discipline he brought to this whole process and exercise, without which it would not be possible. Those of us who had the privilege of participating uh, uh, since uh, 2000 in the, in the incipient stage of this report on the economic and trade policy side, I think we've achieved uh, a kind of rough justice and appropriate modesty about our role and the role of those themes. We get that security diplomacy uh, are the bones and muscle of the relationship. Uh, but Matt and I, I think, are prideful that um, uh, economics and the financial architecture uh, is the skin that covers it and that presents the face to the world that everybody in Asia and indeed globally sees of U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's sustained by American corporations, Japanese corporations, um, and again, by the financial architecture that we share and have put together uh, as, uh, as a matter of self-interest. Uh, you know, among the things that everybody knows is that uh, we both uh, lost uh, ground to China's ambitions in the region. I, I'd remind you that w the United States uh, invests roughly three times in Southeast Asia uh, what China does. Japan has a similar lead. Um, and so we set out to look at, as Sheila just said, look at some of the advantages to assess them and see what they mean for our shared interest in advancing those interests, mindful of the fact that we've been chastened by uh, the loss of two foundational pieces of energy in the trade liberalization processes, both the Doha Round and the TPP. So what comes next? How should we think about uh, amplifying our interest? And protectively, how should we think about uh, making sure that we prepare for the inevitable next crisis. We're looking at unacceptable mountains of debt in both countries. That's, that's a risk we share. And we've actually seen trade growth level off in the last couple of months, which is, uh, I'll leave Matt to explain that. I, I, I can't, but I just posed you the question, what a different world it would have been if the U.S. and Japan 
weren't playing the role that they played in 1987 and again in 2008 to put a floor underneath risk in the world markets. Uh, so uh, with, with that as a predicate, uh, and I should be very clear, Matt provided the um, intellectual leadership for this effort uh, and, 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 a lot of, uh, and a lot of the language. Uh, so over, over to you. Uh, Rich, you want to? Matt. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Honored to be part of this. My first time actually participating in this, although I've been a, an avid reader, reader of it for the last 18 years, so delighted to be part of it now. I was told that my role was to explain what Kevin really meant. Um, so, uh, but seriously, um, I, did, I just want to make two points. One, economics is at the heart of the U.S.-Japan alliance. I have a little parlor game that I play with my national security oriented friends and ask them what does Article 2 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty talk about? And most of them think it has to do with military affairs um, or peace um, related issues. And in fact, it's about economics. Um, in addition to talking about strengthening uh, free institutions, it, it says, quote, uh, the parties will seek to eliminate conflict in their international economic policies and will encourage economic collaboration between them. So that's Article 2, not Article 22. So it's very much uh, at the heart of what we're supposed to be working together on. Um, and both of those points, eliminating conflict and uh, working together in uh, collaboration, is really what has inspired um, uh, our work here and, and what we've said in the report. So I think it's significant. The very first recommendation, I want to steal Zach's thunder because he's going to go through the specific recommendations, but the very first recommendation is about economics and it's really about this point that we, we need to, in fact, the, the headline is we need to recommit to an open trade and investment regime. And I think that's really uh, fundamental to uh, making the alliance um, strong. Um, and on the back of that, we have um, other specific ideas, but really what they're about is um, extending our shared interests, values, um, and our complementary skills in uh, the now named Indo-Pacific region in particular um, on economic rulemaking and norm setting and standard setting. Um, and so a lot of our recommendations have to do first and foremost with finding a way back to, uh, for the United States, back to TPP. Um, that's not going to happen in the short term, but I think uh, getting back uh, to TPP is, is a critical issue. In the meantime, Japan can work to advance the unpronounceable um, new version of uh, TPP, the comprehensive uh, partnership, um, which it was, uh, showed leadership in, in, uh, in actually producing and, and getting other partners to sign on to. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done bilaterally. Um, regionally through APEC uh, with other partners like Australia and Korea um, and globally through institutions like the G20 um, and the WTO and other organizations where we are uh, important uh, critical players. Um, and we, we, we talk about really the, the core substantive issues that we think we have particular stake in together. And, and those relate to things like the digital economy and establishing the rules and standards in, in that space is critically important to both countries um, in uh, disciplines on state-owned enterprises and the role of the state in the marketplace is another critical interest for us. Um, intellectual property standards, market opening. These are all things that we have um, aligned views on and um, we should be working more actively together to advance those things through all of those different forums. And then on infrastructure, we have a separate recommendation. This is obviously something where both the United States and Japan have a strong interest in promoting high quality infrastructure across uh, the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. And so we have um, thoughts on that as well. Uh, bottom line though, I think we start with, we need to avoid distractions uh, like um, uh, trade frictions that are not uh, based on uh, true uh, underlying interests and um, uh, certainly not on false uh, relations to, to national security issues, which a lot of these issues have been linked to. And so, uh, and we need to move on away from those issues towards actually working together cooperatively in third countries on economic cooperation as Article 2 mandates. Thanks. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Zach Cooper to uh, give us uh, an expose of the uh, recommendations that we have in our report. Very briefly, you can read about them, but uh, I think a little explanation from Zach will be extraordinarily helpful. 
Great, I'll be as quick as possible. At first, I wanna just uh, say that I appreciate so much the opportunity to be in this group of mentors and role models. Uh, it's fantastic to get to work with people such as those on the stage. And many of these recommendations come from people not only on the stage, but also some in the audience and others who've worked on the Alliance over many years. Um, in the pursuit of an ambitious agenda for the Alliance, we prioritize three imperatives, and you can see these in the report. The first is strategic effectiveness, particularly in terms of warfighting and deterrence capabilities. The second is long-term political sustainability. And the third is resource efficiency, because we know that just spending more isn't enough, we have to spend smartly. And with that in mind, we came up with four broad buckets of ideas uh, and 10 specific recommendations, which you can read about in the report. And they seek to strengthen bilateral economic ties, to deepen operational coordination, to advance joint technology development, and to expand cooperation with regional partners. So I'll walk through just each one of those briefly, as, and you can see much more detail in the report, and I'm sure it'll come up in the Q&A as well. So first, as Matt mentioned, to strengthen bilateral economic ties, we recommend that the allies recommit to an open trade and investment regime. And in particular, we suggest that the two governments establish a business and government dialogue, bringing together American and Japanese CEOs with senior officials from both capitals to set a practical agenda to address remaining structural issues between the two economies. In addition, to deepen operational cooperation, we recommend that the Allies operate from combined bases. Uh, this is something that's been talked about in previous reports, and we believe that this would minimize the impact on host populations while also maximizing deterrence and warfighting capabilities. We also recommend that the United States establish a standing combined joint task force, which would focus primarily on the Western Pacific, and it would decrease the burden that's currently on the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, and it would help give Japanese commanders more clear lines uh, for them to exchange uh, information and operational details with their counterparts. We also recommend that Japan should create a joint operations command, and this would decrease the burden on the Japanese Self-Defense Force's chief of staff and help its commanders to better manage crises and the strain of increasingly high-tempo operations. And then finally, within the deepening operational coordination bucket, we recommend that the Allies conduct combined contingency planning to respond quickly to acts of aggression by improving the speed and coordination of Allied decision making. In our third bucket, to advance joint technology development, we recommend that the Allies build on the success of SM3 Block 2A by co-developing defense equipment, potentially in areas such as advanced radars, anti-ship missiles, maritime domain awareness, undersea systems, future surface combatants, and amphibious vehicles. We also recommend that the Allies should expand high technology cooperation, particularly by working more closely on intelligence sharing, cyber, space, and artificial intelligence, which should help uh, both of our countries to lead uh, eventually towards a world in which we could imagine Japan being included in the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangement. And then finally, to expand cooperation with regional partners, we have three recommendations. First, we recommend that the Allies reinvigorate trilateral security cooperation, and Victor talked about this in some detail. We focus in particular on information sharing and the servicing of military equipment across uh, all three countries, but also that we should look to expand trilateral exercises where that's possible. We also recommend that the Allies should work together to launch a regional infrastructure fund to provide investment options that emphasize high standards, employment of local labor, social and environmental safeguards, open procurement practices, and reliable returns on investment. And our final recommendation is that we forge a broader uh, regional economic strategy by leveraging existing leadership in trade, investment, development, and financial services to enhance rules on things like digital commerce, state enterprises, and intellectual property protections. So that's a very quick overview, but we think that put together, uh, this is an, certainly an ambitious agenda that will take a certain amount of time, but we think it's necessary to prepare the alliance for the challenges that it will face in the years ahead. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. And now uh, hitting cleanup, uh, we have on the second uh, NIARMA's report, uh, Cara Bue. Uh, Cara? Uh, thank you. Um, what Zach just outlined is a tall order by any standard. And um, as with most things, however, real change happens in a step-by-step -step process. So in that vein, we wanted to highlight some potential specific next steps that should be considered. 
Um, the first has to do with as Japan moves forward with its midterm defense program and its national defense program guidelines, we encourage the U.S. and Japan to coordinate closely during the process as a means to improve our joint ability to fight and defend. In connection with our recommendation on combined bases, we suggest that the U.S. and Japan should study the lessons from existing combined bases, such as Misawa, to identify and learn how to overcome legal, operational, and cultural challenges. To expand high technology cooperation, we encourage Pentagon acquisition officials, including officials at DARPA, to work with Japan to quickly identify a new project or even set of projects for joint development and acquisition. With regard to bilateral contingency planning, we encourage elevating the level and expanding the number of Japanese officers from the self-defense forces embedded within relevant U.S. units, including the planning staff at the Indo-Pacific Command. And finally, while many of our rec recommendations require action from the U.S. and Japanese governments, the onus of the alliance, of alliance maintenance does not fall only on them. The private sector also has an important role to play, and we encourage its full consideration of the recommendations raised in the report, particularly with regard to strengthening bilateral economic ties and joint technology development. As an example of how the private sector can work together um, to better the alliance, uh, the recommendation, one of the recommendations in the, port that, in the report that Zach outlined had to do with a business government dialogue, and we'd encourage um, the U.S. and Japan to move forward on that score. So with those specific ideas, um, I'd like to shift the discussion back to Ambassador Armitage and um, Dr. Nye, and then to the audience for any questions. Thank you very much, Carr. We have two final comments, and then we'll turn it over to you. First, I want to acknowledge that we have here today our good friend, my good friend, one of the best career ambassadors we've ever had as a nation, Mark Grossman, who's here, and I welcome you, Mark, and thank you very much for your presence here. I think you, in, by your presence, bestow on the U.S.-Japan relationship uh, an idea of the importance of that relationship for us, so thank you. Uh, look, we're not naive. We're not foolish. We know what we've done with these recommendations. These are hard. These are far-sighted. Some are just aspirational right now, like the adding to five eyes and having Japan be six eyes. It means Japan has to do a lot more to what they've already done in the protection of their technology. But we are bound to determine, as far as we can make humanly possible, uh, to push the boundaries. Look, in our Defense Department, except for the two officials, uh, uh, Pottinger and Shriver, whom I mentioned, we don't have officers who have served their careers in Asia, like we had in the past. We have officers who know a lot about the Middle East, about Afghanistan, about Iraq, about Syria, but they've not served in Asia. So this is why we made so bold, is to give them what we think is kind of a far-sighted outline, realizing that they're going to have to have to really stretch themselves, and our Japanese allies are going to have to really stretch themselves to reach these. But if we do, will be much better able to do, as Joe and Mike suggest, to deter and to shape, but if necessary, to fight to protect our interests. So I'm going to turn it over to you. As usual, we'll have folks with microphones, I think, and there's first, and I'll, I'll field the questions and sort them out to our staff. To our I'm a Peter Humphrey intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I see nothing that would stop China from loading up an expeditionary force with 50 barges full of concrete, going out to the Senkakus and creating a base uh, by next weekend. And I don't see under any circumstances the United States going to war to defend Japan's ownership of those islands. So this, you know, this, we keep ignoring this, but what's the bottom line here when Japan goes by itself to defend its territory, calls the U.S., and then the U.S. says, eh, I don't think so. Thank you, Dr. Green. 
It's a more complicated problem today than it was three years ago. Uh, the East China Sea, it'll be more complicated three years from now, but I see a lot of things that stop the PLA from loading up barges, starting with the 7th Fleet, the Maritime Self-Defense Forces, and the geopolitical and economic consequences to China of taking on the first and second, uh, first and third largest economies in the world um, at a time when China has no shortage of internal challenges of its own. So I think the, the cost to China would be enormous, and that will be the case for a long time. And if there's any doubt about U.S. Uh, intentions, the fact that every administration uh, since um, uh, Bill Clinton, including President Obama himself, have stated that Article 5 of our treaty applies to the Senkaku, that's a pretty clear message. That's why I think you see uh, China maintaining a high level of operations, but careful. And where uh, Beijing is probing more is in the sort of soft underbelly of the first island chain, which is in the South China Sea. Um, that's where I'd be more worried. Uh, but I think in the East China Sea, there's a pretty robust series of military, political, and economic obstacles to Chinese ambitions. Thank you, Mike. Ma could, could you identify yourself? We've got one down front, please, the lady. Um, thank you very much for an informative um, forum. Um, China's power play in Asia, um, they've chosen the One Belt, One Road as one of their major vehicles uh, for international viability and visibility. Um, and a number of us believe in the West and the South Asia and Europe that vis-a-vis um, -vis trade, that's going to lead to country dependence. That, that means that China is going to move to protect their investments and um, invariably leading to um, expansion in their, uh, their influence and de um, the domestic policies related to these countries and then eventually an incre inc increase in the presence. Um, in, in those particular countries. How do we restrict Chinese imperialism, if we will, and promote economic and international development in the world by U.S.-Japan um, alliances? No. Uh, one has to be careful to take one belt, one road, and separate the advertising function and the slogan from the reality. Uh, when you look at uh, One Belt, One Road, people sometimes say it's like the Marshall Plan, you know, trillion dollars of investment and so forth. That's nonsense. The Marshall Plan, in fact, had the Europeans come together on a coherent program, and uh, the Chinese don't want that at all. The Marshall Plan was grants. Uh, Chinese program is loans. The net effect of this is you have a hodgepodge of different projects uh, which lead to indebtedness on the number of countries, which leads to local reactions. Uh, look at Sri Lanka. Uh, look at the, you know, the, the airport where nobody flies in, the port where nobody sends ships. Uh, this has created a reaction. You're even getting a reaction in Pakistan as well. So you have to, you have to separate the, the sloganeering of One Belt, One Road from the reality. Will China have influence through spending money on infrastructure uh, in a lot of countries, not just in the Belt Road countries? Yes. Can we do something about that? Yes, we can expose what it is. And second, uh, as we uh, recommend in the report, the more in which we, uh, US, Japan, and allies provide help with infrastructure in these countries, the more you can provide an alternative. So I, I, my first point is that uh, discount one belt, one road, uh, for all the hot air that's in it, and you'll find there's a lot less there than meets the eye. Matt, did you want to, as they say I, in the I, Senate, I revise and extend jo your remarks? Sure. Joe, Joe has said it well, and I, I would just say I think that um, a mi big misunderstanding about Belt and Road is that it, it really, um, Xi Jinping put this banner, this headline, on top of something that was really a bottom-up phenomenon of, of Ch Chinese um, state-owned enterprises and construction and steel and concrete and things that needed outlets for their excess capacity, and so they were pushing projects and trying to get funding from uh, Beijing, from the China Development 
Bank and China Export Import Bank, and um, and going out and doing these projects really initially for that reason. And um, and I think um, Xi Jinping saw an opportunity to brand this as something uh, that was a, a big Jap Chinese contribution to uh, the world uh, to create a community of common destiny. I think is the is the slogan that's attached to it. What was missing was in between a lot of coordination and you know really planning as as Joe's implied. And they've gotten themselves into some, some real problems in terms of uh, projects that aren't generating return. And they say they want to get a return on their investments um, that are creating these, um, uh, these, these various forms of blowback. Um, and so it's going to be a lot smaller and more um, troubled infrastructure investments difficult everywhere. Um, if you've rode the metro to get here, I think you have some understanding of that. Um, but in, imagine in that part of the world how much additionally difficult it is. So it's, it's a tough business. But, but you know, China is going to continue doing it. It's a legacy item for Xi Jinping, and I think they will continue to do it. And we have to have a response. And pushing back and stopping them is, is not going to be the answer because the recipient countries want uh, infrastructure. So, but we can bring things to the table. We bring great companies with great products and services that embed in, embedded in that the rule of law, uh, and uh, we bring um, capacity training. Um, we bring high standards of um, social and environmental safeguards, debt sustainability um, uh, approaches and norms, uh, open procurement practices, and there are various um, organizations that we lead and drive that promote those things. So I think there's a lot we can bring to the table. And if we can liberate uh, pension monies and insurance monies uh, that are looking for long-term investments, that'll far trump uh, what uh, China's doing in terms of you know, the uh, supposed trillion dollars. Your question has provoked uh, quite a response. Kevin, yeah. do you want to buy along? Uh, I, I, I do, but I'm mindful of our time. Thank you for the question. Uh, with just two quick footnotes to uh, Joe and, and Matt's views. Uh, one is that um, the country that has, uh, is reacting very badly uh, to a lot of the packaging of, um, and, and where antibodies are being generated uh, to, to Belt and Road notions is China. Uh, this is a country where in no major city can you drink the water from the tap. Um, you might be surprised to know Chinese citizens have noticed this. So, so uh, not, uh, uh, not completely unknown in our political culture, there's starting to be in the netizens world uh, a real conversation about, um, uh, well, well, gee, if, you, if you, wanna, you wanna improve the quality of life, uh, I can't breathe the air, I can't drink the water, um, and, and so forth. Those of you who, who uh, do work and, and, uh, and, and travel there a lot know exactly what this is about. And the other thing is, you, as, as our firm does a lot of deal-based work uh, in emerging markets, and I've got to tell you, it, the list that Matt just ran through, it's tempting in the policy community to say, yeah, 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 there's all that financial architecture stuff. That matters enormously, as does branding, predictability, um, and, and those notions like rule of law, to whether or not you can get a deal done, and to how Rich and I were just out in Indonesia together, to how people perceive Japanese and American companies and what they bring to the game. It, it would be a serious mistake as a practical matter to undervalue that. Right here, on the second row, please. We'll get, we've got time, we'll get to you. Would you identify yourself, please? Good morning. My name is Gerald Heng. I've come from Boston, of New England. <laughs> uh, Uncle Sam has always been dispassionate about anything, about foreign policy, about public affairs, domestic policy, until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And then we know we got Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and when General MacArthur laid down the peaceable constitution for Japan, he, he preserved the emperor so that they can continue to worship the emperor and build their Japanese society as is, and not as in the past. So finally, what happened was, now at this time, Premier Shinto Abi has got what we call the rearmament acts of their Japanese diet or parliament. Uh, strangely, but paradoxically, 
in Okinawa, we have an Uncle Sam Marine uh, son who ran for election. And following a page of Speaker Tip O'Neill, all politics is local, he won the election. He won the election in Okinawa Just Island question. Yeah. on a single principle. Remove the military base. Remove Uncle Sam's military base. So my question is, would all, the, all of this position, Shinto Abe's position and this young Marine son's position, would it enhance the alliance between USA and Japan in relationship with the ASEAN countries who suffered terribly during the Japanese war? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The two presidents in Okinawa has been uh, difficult uh, for a long time now. Uh, more broadly, in uh, Japan, our troops are uh, fairly welcome. Uh, if you look carefully at the recommendations we have, we are looking for ways to relieve uh, burdens on places which are, are crowded. Uh, I noticed that the new governor has now uh, said he's willing to talk uh, to the, uh, the government in Tokyo. Uh, we don't want to be, that is the United States, the meat and the sandwich between Tokyo and a prefecture which happens to be the poorest uh, in Japan. Uh, and I suspect we'll avoid that. But Sheila, would you like to? So there's a lot I could talk about in your comment, but let me just focus in on two pieces. One is the Constitution uh, and the LDP uh, proposal, which was passed by the party this summer, has four elements, one of which you pointed to was Article 9. And Prime Minister Abe, as we all know, has suggested uh, adding a third paragraph to Article 9 uh, with, this, with a sentence that would simply say the self-defense forces are constitutional. I suspect this came out of the 2015 experience of his party and him uh, when the new legislation was passed, that he felt that it needed to be said straight and to the point in the Constitution. But you will also be aware that there are many people in the LDP and outside who actually think a more wholesale rewriting of Article 9 would be a better idea. So I think we're going to watch. Uh, this diet session into the spring, and then obviously in next summer's upper house election, how that conversation unfolds. I, I don't think we should assume that Mr. Abe is the only driver of the debate on constitutional revision in Japan. If you look at the public opinion polling on this, you will see that there's a pretty broad appetite in Japan for this debate. Now, not everybody endorses the LDP's four suggestions. Uh, other parties have other ideas. <laughs> privacy protections, for example, environmental protections, what I would call more 21st century ideas about what needs to be added to the Constitution. But I think you're about to see the Japanese people have a very serious conversation about the document. Uh, and they want the imprimatur of a Japanese voice on that conversation. Now, whether it ends up being a referendum, I don't know. Whether it gets out of the diet, who knows? And I don't think we'll actually know what the Japanese people think until and if we see a national referendum in Japan. But I think it's important, whether we're sitting in Washington or we're sitting in Beijing or we're sitting anywhere around the world, that we understand that the Ch Japanese constitution is the Japanese constitution. And our policymakers here uh, may have opinions on what they'd like to see the self-defense forces do, um, but ultimately it's a debate that will happen across Japan and, and will be resolved by the people of Japan. I think it's a fascinating time to be watching Japanese politics, but I don't think we should be fearful of the process. It's, it's, um, Mike, on, oh, oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, did you want me to speak to Okinawa or no, no? If you want, very I, briefly, I can. I, I had a different topic. So. Oh, I, I'll just very briefly on Mr. Tamaki. Um, you know, he was a member of the Liberal Party. For those of you who don't know, this is the new governor of Okinawa. Uh, he was elected to the lower house in 2009. Uh, he is the son of a U.S. Marine uh, and an Okinawan uh, mother. Uh, he is bicultural in every way. Um, it's, he's a very interesting man. Uh, I'm sure that when he comes to Washington, which all Okinawan governors do, uh, we will all enjoy meeting him and getting to know him better. I, I do think, though, that 
the conversation between Tokyo and Naha is an important one. Uh, and I agree, actually, with Rich that we shouldn't insert ourselves in the middle of it. But I think we should respect it. And we should understand that he didn't win by a narrow margin. He won by a significant electoral margin. And for me, leaving the base issue aside, he's an important new next generation face in Okinawan politics. And it's not just on the main islands of Japan where you're seeing new people come into politics, a new generation of leaders in Japan. You're also seeing it in Okinawa, and we need to learn a little bit more about what they think. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Mike? Um, the question also um, raised Japan's relationship with Southeast Asia, and I wanted to briefly uh, point out one more change, important change from the 2000 report to today, and that is in virtually every poll you look at, um, uh, Japan is listed as the most trusted country in Southeast Asia, ahead of Australia, the U.S., China, uh, which is a remarkable change, an asset for the U.S., frankly, and for Japan. There was a Lowy Institute poll in Australia recently that asked, what leader do you trust to do the right thing? And they had our president and many other leaders. Um, after Malcolm Turnbull, who was prime minister at the time, Australians said they trusted Shinzo Abe the most to do the right thing. So it, that's quite a transformation. It doesn't mean history's over. It doesn't mean um, there are sensitive issues uh, that are not there. But that's, a, that's a, an asset for Japan and therefore for the U.S. By the way, Malcolm Turnbull speaking here tomorrow at CSIS for those of you who like Australian politics. <laughs> we have two here, and then I'll get back over to the middle. Chris Nelson. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, the usual fantastic report, so many possible questions. But I find myself worried increasingly about the trilateral aspects of it, uh, with our Korean friends especially. Uh, I'd like to hear more, uh, especially from from my convictor who've been on, in on, on this kind of thing. What are the potential disconnects you're worried about with the next set of things with, with uh, North, the North and between the North and the South, and how can we fit management of those potential disconnects into what we're talking about here? Because you know you can't get there if you fall into a hole there. And I worry also about uh, domestic political will. Uh, you know, we're all the pros. We do all the trade and all the military and all this stuff. So you don't have to sell us on the alliance, and we don't have to sell each other on the alliance. But uh, you look at this, you know, absurdities like, you know, Osaka, you know, defriending San Francisco, right? And you go, what in the hell is going on here? Has, you know, is any, are there any adults in charge? And our South Korean friends, similarly, do they really actually want to be tight with, with, with Japan? I, you know, it, you, you worry about that. It isn't just us elites. It's, it's actual real people. So. Uh, two separate questions. How do we compensate for the, and what do you see as potential disconnects that are going to have to be managed? Thanks. Is your question related to this? We'll field two then, right here in the second row. I promise to get back over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Natividad Fernandez, Georgetown University, and my question is related to the situation in Korea. So I wonder how far or how close is the reunification of Korea, because uh, according to some uh, political statements, some days it seems that it's very, very close. So my question is uh, how this uh, reunification uh, will impact on the relationship on the, on the uh, US-Japan uh, alliance and also in the tri trilateral uh, relationship. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chow, would you like to field the first and then Dr. Green? Um, <coughs> so I, I think that, um, it's important to remember that um, for the three, for Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo, we have to look at this problem in terms of the full spectrum of threats that that are presented. I mean, this is not simply an issue of some um, um, recently tested uh, missiles that are in not even in the production phase yet, um, <clears throat> and it's not only about artillery. It's about everything in between those, those things. And presumably, if these negotiations move forward, as people talk about them moving forward, um, any sort of settlement would be addressing not just one aspect of the threat, 
but multiple aspects of the threat. Now, is there a chance for delinking or decoupling? Certainly there is. You know, there is that chance. But that is why trilateral coordination is so important. Uh, that is why um, this has to be not simply something that is on the to-do list that you just check off like mowing the lawn, but it's, it's something that becomes a normal part of practice of doing diplomacy, doing this nuclear diplomacy in Asia. And it's not, it, and, it, and there are benefits to it. It's not just the negative side of avoiding decoupling. Um, Japan, if there is any solution um, um, that includes the lifting of sanctions on North Korea and the provision of assistance, Japan would be an integral part of that. Japan and South Korea would be an integral part of that. Um, it would be hard to imagine that they wouldn't be in, in, an integral part. Um, <clears throat> on, the, um, con on the notion of peace declaration, you know, again, I think this is something where we could potentially see delinking. But then it's also in none of the country's interest to see a peace declaration for a bad deal you know, a peace declaration in return for something that does not meet minimum standards of verification, uh, uh, minimum standards of um, um, whether it's on the nuclear side or conventional force threat reduction on the, on the, on the conventional side. Um, so there, I think there's a lot more in common among the three countries uh, than we normally think of because everybody's focused on one party moving very quickly while the other part of the United States is sort of trailing behind, except for the president who says we've achieved everything we haven't yet negotiated. Um, <clears throat> and then there's Japan that seems to be very far back. I think actually if you look at this, if you lay out sort of what the interests are, there's a lot more commonality than, than is generally appreciated. And then finally, in terms of the domestic will of a progressive government, the first progressive government in South Korea, in terms of Japan-Korea relations. As Rich said at the, at the end of the initial remarks, you know, we're not naive. We know some of the things that we look for in this report are not easy. Um, <clears throat> but in the long term, um, whether you're talking about a united Korea or a Korea that is trying to rec reconcile with North Korea, the relationship, um, the, the, that backstopping any of that flux with strong trilateral alliance coordination, that, there is no downside to that that I can think of. And, while um, progressive governments are generally less willing to engage in sort of bilateral and trilateral coordination, um, they also understand it's a necessity. Um, um, whether we're talking about um, security agreements or we're talking about economic agreements going into the future. The atmospherics and the pageantry around South Korean President Moon Jae-in's Pyongyang declaration and summit with Kim Jong-un uh, evokes all of the Korean people's natural desire for unification, um, singing Arirang, the flag with the Korean Peninsula. But the reality is the South Korean Constitution says there will be one Korea and South Korea is in charge, and the North Korean Constitution says there will be one Korea and North Korea is in charge. And the possibility of this leading to a peaceful uh, unification or even confederation is, in my view, and I think Victor would agree, very, very remote. But change can so come very quickly to the Korean Peninsula, and when uh, it does, it will likely not be controlled. It will likely be very quickly. And when that happens, um, there's a scenario where it um, leads to cooperation among the big powers to peacefully unify the peninsula and make sure it's denuclearized and make sure that there's um, a multilateral framework for confidence building and trade and everything else, but there's also a scenario where the sudden change on the Korean Peninsula brings out all the worst geopolitical rivalries of three millennia <laughs> uh, between Japan, Russia, China, uh, and the U.S. Um, so one more reason that the trilateral U.S.-Japan-Korea relationship is so important is because I think it stabilizes that and makes it less likely there will be the geopolitical rivalry. Polls pretty consistently show most Koreans want a U.S.-Korea alliance after unification. Um, China's position is that unification should be what Beijing calls independent unification, which means the Korean Peninsula is independent from the U.S. There is no alliance. So that is going to be the crux of the matter. And if there is not a relationship between Japan and Korea that's positive, between the U.S.-Japan alliance and the U.S.-Korea alliance that's positive, that's going to leave open a kind of wedge or an opening where Beijing will be tempted to try to push for independent unification. So I think it's in Korea's interest ultimately to demonstrate um, 
not containment of China, but a solidarity with Japan to, to dissuade China from thinking it can push for what it appears most Koreans uh, don't want, which is um, a separation from the US after unification. So in the long run, all of this trilateral stuff matters a lot. Victor, you have a two finger. Just a, just a, just a quick, I mean, just a quick data point, which is so, um, one of our projects here at CSIS, um, uh, something called Beyond Parallel, looks at uh, the question of unification, where we've interviewed a whole bunch of experts in government affairs. Maybe some of you in the audience have filled out our surveys. If you have, thank you very much. If you haven't, shame on you. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we found from that, when we asked um, experts and officials from, the, uh, from all the countries in the region how they felt about unification, the alignment of U.S., Japan, and South Korean views on all sorts of questions ranging from denuclearization to health conditions to infrastructure, there was more alignment among those three countries than any others in the region. So. Chris, let me just go to your second point quickly. Um, on public opinion, the thing that strikes me is how much more resilient it's been than we might have expected a lot of people interpreted the 2016 election as a populist reaction against American alliances where we'd been taken advantage of. And what's intriguing, and, and remember this is in the context of candidate Trump telling David Sanger that maybe Japan and Korea should get their own nuclear weapons. That is totally vanished. There's no public opinion in support of that. And what's more, when you look at public opinion in support of the U.S.-Japan alliance, it's proven su substantially resilient. Uh, and uh, I think w w a lot of us are going to be in t Tokyo next week for the Mount Fuji dialogue and the Nikkei events. But when Rich and I did this a year ago, I was amazed at how strong the support was for for the alliance. I don't think that's changed. So, so in a sense, the most intriguing thing about public opinion might be the old Sherlock Holmes saying, the dog that didn't bark. Can we go to the middle here? Someone in the fourth row, one, two, three, four. You've been very patient. And then we'll go to Keio University. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. So my name is Satoru Nagao, the Hudson Institute. The this recommendation mentioned the conduct combined. I don't think we can hear you very well. Thank you very much. I, I will speak from past. The, my name is Saturna. The, this recommendation mentioned the conduct combined contingency planning. The, this recommendation is very important, I think, the, but at the same time, with to all respect. If it looks like the, this recommendation only apply in the Northeast Asia. So if dogram type incident in the Indochina border area or as a crisis happen in the Maldives, uh, what kind of combined contingency planning the United States and Japan can conduct is my question. Thank you very much. Zach. Zach. <laughs> well, I, Dr. I think Cooper. That's a great question. And Dr. Ngao, thanks for your work on Japan India relations. Um, I, I would say we do think combined contingency planning is important, but we have to understand that there are legal restrictions in Japan to the scope of that kind of contingency planning. And we want to be very respectful, as Sheila said to Japan deciding where and how it wants to interpret its, uh, its own rules and uh, legislation. And so uh, we have not been specific about where the combi combined contingency planning should occur. I would say, I think as a first step, the East China Sea is the place to begin, um, simply because that's where we're under the most pressure and that's the most important place for the alliance to be particularly strong. There's no question that we've been doing more outside the East China Sea. You know, we've been talking a lot about South China Sea and we've seen Japan operate there into the Indian Ocean as well. Um, but I think as a beginning point, what we would say is let's begin in the East China Sea uh, and be able to respond quickly to any kind of uh, Chinese escalation there. And then we can see where things go depending on how uh, Tokyo and Washington uh, believe the, the matter should be settled. Thanks. Dr. Nakayama. My name is Toshi Nakayama from Keio University. I am now at the Wilson Center until next summer. Uh, one short co uh, comment and one short question. Uh, despite what uh, Professor Nai said, uh, in the first and the second and third, re third report uh, came, uh, came out, we were quite confident that it was an all-American voice. But this time, this time around, I think there's doubts. 
And yes, I, I do agree that most of the Japanese people support the alliance. But there's this sense, I call it shogunai realism. It's there's no other option realism. So I, ha I think you have to sort of you know, take into account the Japanese doubts to a certain degree. And I'm sure all my friends are watching this event back, in ho back home <laughs> on the web. So I, 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 I hope you can address us. On this specific point, uh, you recommended including Japan into the Five Eyes. And in the first report, you said the Japanese intelligence community has to do more. So are you now confident that you could sort of propose you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, including Japan into the Five Eyes? Because we don't see the intelligence cooperation when we're outside. So is, this, is there a sort of common feeling that intelligence cooperation, at least between the US, has sort of, you know, been improved and you're comfortable that you, now you can sort of propose uh, including Japan to the Five Eyes. So that would be my question. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Nakayama, as I understand it, you want to know how serious we are about Five Eyes adding to it and what is the realistic possibilities. Let me be clear. It is our view that just doing what we've been doing for the past several years is not sufficient. We make the point uh, that if you're standing still, you're falling behind. And I made the comment that part of what we talk about, like Five Eyes, is aspirational. There has to be a lot of change on the Japanese side. But from my point of view, and knowing what I know about the intelligence sharing between the United States and Japan, we're pretty far along. We're pretty far along. Now, I think some of the other members of the Five Eyes would have some questions. Not everybody would immediately come along, but I don't think anybody would question what we say in the report that that is that Japan is our most important ally in the most important region of the world. Therefore, I think policymakers in the United States and intelligence officials in the United States could make a very good case if Japan has all the protections necessary in place uh, to really uh, make a good argument for six eyes for Japan. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Harry, uh, Reagan Foundation. Uh, this one is for you, Rich. Uh, I want to talk about the balance of power in the uh, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm talking about China now. Uh, the, the, the security treaty that was, that was signed between the two countries uh, helped protect Japan, as you know. Uh, however, the Japan was up here, but now China is up here spending military budget like something like 7.9% of their GDP. And now, because of North Korea, Japan beginning to spend more money in the military to protect themselves. Uh, I know that. But this is for you, Rich. Can you talk about China and balance on power? I'm probably not the best suited, but I can talk to it. Um, first of all, it, it is right that Japan is spending more on defense, as you suggest, but the Abe administration for the past several years has been adding to the defense budget, not just about North Korea, more generally. Uh, and when we look at Japan, when we think about it, we don't look at Japan standing alone. We see Japan with the United States and the combination is able to deter, we have been able to deter, and that is the view of all of our friends. Uh, Mike talked about the view in Southeast Asia. They all have that view. That doesn't mean that we should slacken the efforts or anything like that. We have to also not see China, I think, as 10 feet tall. My personal view is Xi Jinping is powerful, he's secure in his position, but he's brittle. He's brittle. There are questions in this society about how he's spending his money. There are questions in society about Obor, which has been spoken about up here. There are questions about why the people's uh, armed police are growing uh, apace. Uh, why do you need so many for domestic enforcement? Uh, so we have to do the best we can with our relationship, not see our uh, possible adversary, and I'm not right yet calling China an adversary. Uh, if we do our job, and if great diplomats like Mark Grossman do their job, we'll prevent China from becoming an adversary. 
but it's not for sure. It's not for sure. So Mike, anybody want to add? Henry Newsom, is this, people can hear me? Central Gulf Lines, uh, our CGL's partner is NYK, Japanese-based global shipping giant. Uh, I'm also a Seventh Fleet veteran. Uh, Japan has a chronic energy thirst, and it's particularly acute post-Fukushima. The U.S. has experienced an energy renaissance, blessed with shale, and we're en route to becoming a dominant global natural gas exporter and also a strong oil exporter. Why was energy cooperation not addressed in the report? In addition to energy and economic implications, an energy agreement might be linked to strengthening American sea lift, which is critical to our alliance and has been in long-term decline. In the previous report, I think the previous two reports, we emphasized energy, in particular LNG, um, and recommended, in effect, an LNG alliance. Um, the way the rules work in the U.S., as you know, you have to have a free trade agreement to get uh, permits to you know, import LNG from the U.S., and we, want, we recommended moving ahead with an agreement that would be something like what you're describing with the benefits you describe, um, secure um, sources for Japan, um, the basis for cooperating on um, merchant marine transportation and uh, security through the MSDF and uh, and the Navy, <clears throat> um, and, uh, and and helping Japan wean uh, its own dependence on um, less secure areas of the world for natural gas. So it's, I, you know, we, we tried to keep the report brief, I think it's fair to say, but all of us who participated last time uh, made that uh, a, a key point, and I think you're, you're right to raise it. It's, it's, a, it's an area where we should be cooperating. I'd like to, I'd like to make a, a point here, if I may. Uh, I was talking about the aspirational nature of at least one of our uh, recommendations and the difficult nature of a lot of them. But if you were to look at all three of our reports and look at all the different recommendations, at the time, people were saying, oh, it's too difficult, can't be done. And I don't think any of them have failed to be accomplished. And I'm looking forward to the same happening over time to this. Uh, we've got, uh, I just put that out there for you. We've got uh, about three more questions, I think. One. Sure. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant and uh, formerly foreign researcher at Kyoto University. Um, the U.S. military doctrine has evolved towards an emphasis on joint force operations. I've seen the comment made many times that in terms of the Japanese self-defense forces, they don't have that level of integration in, in their operations that uh, the U.S. forces do. So when you're proposing uh, joint commands and so forth and so on, have, have you addressed the issue that the actual military doctrines would need to be uh, reconciled more than they are now? Um, yeah, I think that's an absolutely critical point. Uh, you know, over the last 20 years, the United States has done an immense amount of work to make the U.S. military much more joint. And Japan has been working on jointness uh, for the last decade as well, um, but has a lot uh, farther to go. And we certainly recognize that. And I think that's part of the idea behind the Joint Operations Command. Uh, part of what's been so valuable in, say, Australia, where they actually have a Joint Operations Command, is that they've been able to deal not only with some of the challenges relating to actual day-to-day -day operations, but also to training, uh, to readiness issues, by having a more innovative command structure. So um, part of our recommendation for the Joint Operations Command isn't just to, you know, many people often think of this as something like the Indo-PACOM Command. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that combines both operations and training and exercise to get at the underlying jointness that we need to see from Japan. And that also will help them be able to work more easily with U.S. forces, which are extremely joint uh, and still working uh, to get more so. And um, there is no real doctrinal or legal barrier to jointness among the three Japanese self-defense forces. And in fact, in recent years, there's been a joint base in Djibouti. There's been a joint missile defense command. <clears throat> um, and the, the joint staff in Japan has actually put forward for the first time, joint requirements, Global Hawk, that are not service specific. So within Japan, it's really more of a cultural issue, which you know is understandable. We have not 
since Goldwater and Nickel has completely gone purple ourselves. Bilateral uh, jointness, the biggest obstacle is probably the ban on collective self-defense. And the change in interpretation a few years ago has helped to remove that. So I'd say uh, it's mainly cultural and to some extent budgetary. That's why we're pushing this joint operational command idea a little bit, because there are supporters within Japan, um, but the obstacles are more budget and culture. Uh, we have a paper we did here at CSIS uh, put out by an Australian colonel on their experience with their jock, and they had cultural and budgetary issues too. Um, it's doable. This is a, a, not the most ambitious of our recommendations, I think. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis Yoshida, uh, Sasakawa, USA, retired U.S. Department of Energy, uh, more probably to Matt. Uh, as he and I have spent uh, many years of our career negotiating bilateral trade agreements and technology cooperation agreements. If you could speak a little bit more, I think, than the panel has to the recent announcement of bilat renewed bilateral trade negotiations, pros, cons, outcomes, and then second, given that that will probably be a time of a little bit more escalating bilateral tension, as those of us who worked in the 80s saw, what are some of the good merging good news issues that perhaps the panel sees to offset some of that, sort of like we had science in the 90s? Thank you. Um, well, I think in, um, in the current um, environment here in Washington, it strikes me that we're always looking kind of through a second best lens um, or at these issues. And so I'd say first best is the US shouldn't have pulled out of TPP and we should have been working with Japan on these issues in that context. But given that we're, uh, we did do that and we're uh, where we are, I think this agreement with Japan is not bad. At least it um, uh, protects um, against some of the things that we were all worried about, at least it seems to for now. Uh, like the prospect of applying um, tariffs on automobiles from Japan uh, that and elsewhere uh, um, for supposed national security reasons, which is going to be interesting to see how the Commerce Department, where you used to work, um, I'm sure you feel for your successors there how they're going to justify that. Uh, but it seems like Japan's dodged that bullet. Japan's also protected um, some of its um, red lines on agriculture and so forth. Um, but the U.S. has gotten you know what it wanted, which was a bilateral discussion and so we'll see where that leads and we do mention it it was the last thing we added to the report when it was already we had to stop the presses to make a reference to this deal um, and we said we you know we're not sure where it's going to go but it's not not a bad thing um, and then I don't know whether your question was about other irritants that are beyond economics just or, or other good news opportunities science medicine other things I mean I think there's lots of good stuff there um, and, and that's the kind of thing we ought to be promoting, but, but I don't know whether. Yeah, I mean, if, if we haven't emphasized this enough, I would just add Japan's leadership in picking up the, the broken shards and pieces of TPP and moving forward. That was not inevitable, was it? In fact, it was a typical, uh, we're, we're, we're grateful. Uh, uh, hopefully you can leave part of the door open. One, one cautionary note. Uh, on autos and both the Japan agreement and the Europe agreement, I, w I would just note with concern, this is the trade lawyer in me, that um, February of next year is the deadline, uh, the notional deadline on the 232 process. I don't think we've heard the end of this. Uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting that in whatever we're calling NAFTA 2.0, um, the, uh, uh, it included protective language for Mexico and Canada in the event of auto trade limits. Well, well you're a trade negotiator. Why do you put those kind of things in, uh, in, in, in the belief, if not certainty, that uh, the risk persists? Uh, two more. You, sir, and then over there, and then we'll call it a day. Right up here, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, terrific panel. Vanga Maradian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Rich, I want to pick up on uh, a point that you uh, made about the use of language, right? Um, you know, it's, it's not an adversary, whereas this administration looks like it's leaned a lot further to label China as a potential adversary, uh, which then colors everything, right? The economic conflict now, the Chinese feel like they can't back down because that's still a proxy confrontation with the United States. What's the role of language in this? 
and more broadly, what do you think the strategy has to be? Because all of you have addressed different elements of this from the, from the economic to, to the strategic. Um, not to invoke Graham Allison and the Thucydides trap here a little bit, but you know, there's a little bit of a concern about that. But you can address that anyway. I know, I know what your thoughts on that are, but I, I, that was just a free gimme to give you a chance to, to address that. But more broadly, what does the language need to be here? Do we need to be a little bit less strident on the language in order to be able to get all the lines of national power aligned? What's the role of rhetoric here? Well, to me, uh, language does matter. Uh, I didn't. I won't say that China will never be an adversary, but I think I would. My colleagues have all dedicated ourselves to do what's reasonable, logical, and supportive of our alliances to keep them from becoming an adversary. So I do use terms as a competitor. Sometimes we can cooperate, um, but uh, just if we see them as an adversary, we do tend to put them in a box. We tend to see, for instance, this tariff regime which I'm not opposed to correcting the economic playing field or leveling the playing field, and certainly I'm not opposed to protection of our intellectual property rights, there's no question about it. But there's an irony, in my view, my colleagues may not share this, in our tariff approach to China. If China were to do everything that we asked China to do economically, China would be much stronger. China would be economically more powerful. China would be able to put more money into security. So it's a matter of emphasis, it seems to me, rather than just blanket approaches. And Joe, you look like you're going to jump on, and then we have one other. But I, I take your point that language is important. We've got to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time as a country. And we seem to always have to have a pendulum. Either they're a total adversary or they're a close partner. Uh, that's ridiculous. They're going to be both. And what we have to learn is that uh, uh, we're going to have areas where we need to cooperate with them and areas where we're going to compete. You're going to have FONOPs and cooperation on climate at the same time because those are both things that that are important, uh, and we should, in principle, be able to do both. The danger I see is we get too hung up on, on uh, language or metaphors, like the Thucydides trap. Uh, we get ourselves into a, a trap. Uh, Thucydides traps often used to say, well, this is going to be like uh, the way Germany caused a threat to Britain at the turn of the last century which created anxiety in Britain, which led to World War I. Well, there are two things to note about what Thucydides said. One was the rise of a new power. The other is the fear it created. And if we let ourselves overstimulate the fear, we can have a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's worth remembering that Germany had already passed Britain in industrial strength by 1900, 14 years before World War I. China has not passed the United States. You know, purchasing power parity, you don't import jet engines at purchasing power parity. And if you look instead at exchange rates, we're still a $20 trillion economy. They're about a $12 trillion economy. Doesn't mean Chinese power isn't growing and won't continue to grow, but if we get ourselves into it, uh, you know, a, a dither about China's past us and the threat is here and so forth, we can talk ourselves into something we don't want. What we're saying in this report is working with Japan and Australia and India and others, we can shape the environment where China has to moderate some of its power ambitions. That's perfectly doable. This is not like World War I. It's not a Thucydides trap. People say they're going to drive us past the first island chain. Excuse me, Japan is part of the first island chain. I mean, so the language we use can get us into deeper trouble than we need. As I said, we're going to have to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. Amen. We have one last question. And then. Thank you. Jung Kim, visiting scholar at the George Washington University. I'm from the Korean Exim Bank. Um, well, we are witnessing the negative side effects of China money invading small and poor states with no further consideration of synergy effects after investment. Well, um, 
the small, state, small and poor states need two stuffs at least for their development. First, domestic consumption market and trading partners, right? Um, how can you make your uh, infrastructure investment fund or regional economic cooperation plan more attractive than China uh, money plan over those uh, uh, small states? That's my well, I mean, I, I think, you know, money isn't everything. Um, you know, money's important. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we do, need to, we do need to spend more money. And I think some of the things that the Trump administration is doing, um, working with Congress, are, are encouraging in this regard. There, there's a, a piece of legislation called the BUILD Act, which is basically doubling the size of the OPIC um, um, uh, where uh, Kevin used to sit on the board, he can talk about that if he wants, but um, and allowing them to take more active positions in some of these projects. So we're doing uh, little things. We have uh, USAID, Japan has JICA that does a lot of work that isn't that expensive in capacity building and training. If you go to Myanmar, as I did in, in last spring, and you go to the development ministry there and you visit this former general who's the guy everybody tells you to go and see because he's the smart guy who's kind of figuring all this out from Myanmar, a really impressive guy. Um, you walk past the JICA office where there's a Japanese man, I think his name is Mr. Ueda, who's wearing a sarong and he gives you his card and he's embedded in this ministry trying to help uh, Myanmar uh, plan and ex execute its development strategy. This is something China doesn't do. We do this well and I think um, we can do more of that together without spending huge amounts of money. So I think there's a lot we can do. Yeah, in, indeed. Matt's right. Money isn't everything, but as my favorite economist Madonna says, money changes everything. <laughs> um, and everything that Matt talked about um, in response to your question, it's, it's yes, but we, and I mean U.S. and Japan, have to adequately resource these efforts. It's not just about financial architecture and, and technology and, and, and whatnot. Uh, the, money, the money does have to be there in the end uh, in order to create the energy and the interest and, and uh, to sustain the way we want to be doing business. I think we have a tremendous advantage. It would be up to us to lose it. Uh, but indifference, and that's part of what this report is about, I think, indifference or inattention could create that problem. Well, it remains to me to, first of all, along with Dr. and I, to thank uh, our panelists uh, for their activities. Uh, great to work with, and uh, I can't promise you we won't have a fifth arm in his nigh, but some of us are getting a little longer in the tooth, so I think it's unlikely. <laughs> Second, I'd like to thank CSIS uh, for their stewardship of this. They're uh, putting together this uh, excellent report uh, and for their general uh, housekeeping uh, for the last uh, hour and a half. But most of all, I want to thank all of you who had enough interest enough kindness to stay here for an hour and a half and, and listen to us and hopefully uh, if you agree disagree that's all fine as long as we've all thought a little bit about this issue so thank you very much thank you well, I'll see you in tokyo <laughs>